Okay, good evening. I'm Mary Thoreau. I'm chairman and CEO of the Independent Institute. And thank you so much for joining with us. We really appreciate Senator Rand Paul's hosting us for this evening's conversation. From crisis to opportunity, COVID lockdowns and educational freedom. Dr. Paul has served as the principal voice for liberty in the U.S. Senate since 2011, for which we are most grateful. He's also a doctor and a surgeon, so we might have hoped that his entreaties to his colleagues to act rationally during the COVID hysteria might have been given greater weight. In addition to his well-known grillings of Anthony Fauci, Dr. Paul has been a continuously active and vocal opponent for mandates with no scientific basis, most recently in calling for a repeal of the vaccine mandate for Senate pages. In other rate, issues ranging from social media censorship to his current warnings of the U.S. government's weaponizing AI to suppress speech, Dr. Paul has diligently fought to protect our liberties from overreaching politicians and bureaucrats. My late husband and I count Rand and his father, Ron, as longtime friends and comrades in the arms of the battle for liberty. And it's a very great pleasure to be together this evening. Rand. Thank you, Barry. I'm a big fan of the Independent Institute and all the great works that you do, as well as providing great knowledge and bringing new authors to uh, the cause of liberty and trying to shine a light to the rest of us. I go to work or I come to Washington early in the week on Monday and at the end of the week I fly home usually. I'm expecting to be greeted by my wife, maybe a hug, maybe a kiss, maybe a martini. But when I get to the door and I knock on the door and the door's open, my wife's there to greet me. You know what she says to me? She says, how come Anthony Fauci's not in jail yet? Which is probably the most common question I get as I travel around the country. And it's not for lack of trying. I've referred him to the Department of Justice. You've seen who's running the Department of Justice lately. Unlikely to get any justice there. Probably never been more politicized than at any time. But it's discouraging to people. People come up and they're worried that uh, the legal system is going to be attributed to you if they don't like your politics or what you do, who you support, that there's one set of justice for conservatives and another set of justice for the rest. We're very, very worried about the direction we're going. I think the biggest thing we learned with regard to the, you know, the, the pandemic was that people's fidelity to the Bill of Rights, people's fidelity to limitations on government kind of went out the window. People just said they could do anything. You know, they did do anything. They shut churches down in my state. Our governor sent the police to a church on Easter to record the license plates of those who had the gall to go to church on Easter. Almost every one of his mandates were struck down. But it was an amazing sort of arrogance of power that came out of government. It also brought out the worst in people. Anybody ride on a plane during this? I rode on a plane every week. I rode on one plane when nobody was on. That was the best time I ever had. But I rode on planes where, you know, the flight attendant essentially had become a, a stormtrooper. Sir, sir, you're not eating your peanuts fast. Put your mask on in between every peanut. You know, just the nonsense, the, the, the advocacy for things that did not work and had no influence on our health. We finally have the, the Cochrane analysis, 78 peer-reviewed papers. Mask don't work in the public setting. And people say, well, what about, why do doctors sometimes wear them? Well, because we, we need to look at the individual circumstances of every patient and situation. If you go into a patient's room, it makes sense. They wore gloves, they wore gowns, they washed their hands, and they threw away their mask when they came out. If you ask me, if you're 75 years old and your spouse has COVID, what should you do? You're going to take care of them? You're going to take them food? I probably would have told you, wash your hands first, wear an N95 mask, and when you come out of the room, take it off. But I wouldn't tell you to wear it to the grocery store and to the park and to the picnic. There are reasons for all of these things. But a one-size-fits-all isn't the way government ought to work. We also be discovered that there are all kinds of arcane rules and laws from the 1930s and 40s, and they took these laws just to do whatever they want. There was a law about contagions passed a CDC law back in the 1930s and it says that for 13 different specific diseases, not COVID, because they didn't know about it, you can have 
some quarantines. And we can argue about whether that's a good idea or not, but then the final clause of the law from the 1930s says, and whatever other measures are necessary. That was interpreted by the previous administration and this administration to mean that the government had the right to abrogate all rental contracts. For two years, you didn't have to pay your car payment or your house payment or your rent because of a CDC law about quarantining. This is government run amok, but these are people who I, the way I see it, have an impulse to authoritarianism. It brought up the worst in people. I don't know if you remember seeing on the internet, there was a woman, she says, I'm a teacher, and she's yelling at two 10-year-old boys who are like wrestling and playing football in a park by themselves. You're going to kill us. You're going to kill all of us. And screaming and, and expletives and all works at the top of her lungs about how evil these two boys were. Or the Coast Guard in California, you can probably believe this, going after a paddle border by himself. Or the police chasing down a guy jogging by himself. This is one of my favorite videos. The internet has a lot of good stuff. When the policeman starts to go after him. And the jogger, you can see, sees him out of the corner of his eye. Jogger's real light-footed, good runner. The policeman has big, heavy boots on, and it's in the sand. Who do you think is going to win this one? And you can just see the runner just gradually picking his pace up as the policeman tries to chase him down for the crime of not wearing a mask on the beach. So I think it's worth still continuing to talk about this, to talk about the science of what works, what doesn't work. But ultimately, it's really about our freedom and that we shouldn't give our freedom up in the face of a pandemic. Several of the court cases said the Constitution doesn't go out the window just because of a pandemic. It's precisely in times of emergencies when you have to be most wary of guarding your freedom. When do we lose freedoms? In times of emergencies like war. If you look into our history, when did some of the worst legislation get passed? When was the worst assault? It's war. But pandemics is going to rank right up there. My fear is this comes back again. I won't go about all into the proof for the origins of the virus, but I do believe it came from a lab. We're doing this research in at least 12 different labs around the United States, gain-of-function research. They've denied it and denied it and denied it until about two weeks ago, an email came out. In that email, Anthony Fauci is describing a phone conversation from February 1st of 2020. And you have to remember, when he talks to me in committee, he says, we never, ever funded gain-of-function research in China. In this conversation he's summarizing a conversation from the day before and he says we're very worried about this because the virus looks manipulated and we know in wuhan they're doing gain of function research and they were funding it and yet that's everything he still to this day denied and it is a crime to lie to congress and he did it but the thing is is we need to figure out how we prevent this from happening again there are high-ranking people from the previous administration who believe that the next virus that's released could kill 5 to 50% of the people. We need to be asking the question, you've heard of Ebola? Ebola is spread through bodily transmission. It's a little bit like AIDS. It's not as contagious because it's not spread through the air. Raise your hand if you think it's a good idea for us to fund research in how to aerosolize Ebola. Nobody would be for that, and yet they did that to the avian flu. This is the kind of stuff that needs to have a full-throated discussion. We have 12 labs in the U.S. doing gain-of-function research. We need, you're paying for it, there needs to be discussion on whether it's safe or whether it's dangerous. So my goal is not only culpability for the people who I think look the other way, including not allowing the research to be reviewed by the committees that should have looked at it. There is a safety committee that's supposed to look at this research. This research was routed around that, I think with Anthony Fauci's permission. But we also need to look at legislation that sets up an independent agency, not of the people receiving the money, people not receiving money, to look at this and have the ability to say, that's too dangerous to be done. And this isn't just non-scientists saying this. There are dozens and dozens. There's a growing group of scientists who actually believe that most of this research is not useful knowledge and too dangerous to be done. So I'm going to keep working on that. We're hoping to produce something within a year. I have a book coming out in about a month called Deception, The Great COVID Cover-Up. We're going to talk a lot about what happened throughout all of government and trying to cover this up. But my goal ultimately is to try to prevent this from ever happening again. I commend Mary and the Independent Institute for putting this on. And I would stay longer, except for they tell me the government's out of money and they want more money, believe that or not. 
So people say there's a danger of it closing it down. I think there's a danger of keeping it open and spending money at the same rate. But thank you very much. We're pleased to be joined this evening by two of our esteemed colleagues, Dr. Scott Atlas and Professor James Tooley. We're going to have a short conversation, following which we'll open it up to Q&A with you in the audience. So Scott Atlas is an academic medical doctor and expert advisor on healthcare policy. He's senior advisor at the Independent Institute, where he hosts our podcast, Independent Truths with Dr. Scott Atlas. Dr. Atlas served on President Trump's coronavirus task force and authored A Plague Upon Our House, My Fight at the Trump White House to Stop COVID from Destroying America, detailing that very disappointing experience. He is also the Robert Wesson Senior Fellow in the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, co-director of the Global Liberty Institute, and senior scholar and founding fellow at the Academy for Science and Freedom at Hillsdale College. James Tooley is Vice Chancellor of the University of Buckingham in England, where he also serves as Professor of Educational Entrepreneurship and Policy. He is Senior Fellow at the Independent Institute and author of our recent book, Really Good Schools, Global Lessons for High Caliber, Low Cost Education. Dr. Professor Tooley has dedicated his career to advancing opportunities for poor and disadvantaged children globally. He's done so by shining the light on the many low-cost, for-profit private schools he's found everywhere he has looked, which to date has been 22 countries across four continents. He detailed that experience in his book, The Beautiful Tree, and it was also documented by the BBC and PBS. He's also an educational entrepreneur himself, having founded chains of schools in India, China, and Ghana. He's now turning his focus to opportunities for for for-profit, low-cost schools in the U.S., for which we must grateful. So Scott, we'll start with you. And first of all, thank you so much for answering the call to serve on President Trump's coronavirus task force. As you said, when your president calls and asks for help, it has nothing to do with politics. And it's really disappointing to read about your experiences answering that call and the deaf ear that the people on the coronavirus task force turned when you were bringing reams of scientific data, studies, and articles to help inform them, and also turning a deaf ear to your calls to open schools, protect the vulnerable, and let Americans at very low risk go about our lives. Um, almost equally tragic, will or more, we'll debate that later, is the treatment you've received from your colleagues at Stanford and elsewhere and attempts to cancel you. Um, really, really horrible. However, I know firsthand and really admire your uh, firm resolve to turn those experiences to the good um, in helping us all understand the failures of our so-called authorities and your leadership, your very strong leadership in ensuring appropriate lessons are taken away from that, and most importantly, in establishing standards that ensure that our liberties are protected in the future. Um, We're here this evening to discuss the impacts of recent mandates on children and specifically on education. You regularly quote Nelson Mandela, who said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which, it, in which it treats its children. How's the U.S. doing with that? Well, uh, it, it, I think it, it's, it's reasonable to say that America really failed. Uh, it's uh, even stronger, I would say, it's a disgrace what happened. And, and why do I say it's a disgrace? Well, there were things we knew, and then there were things we did, and then we saw what happened. And and I'll answer it that way. What did we know? And when I say we knew, we knew in spring of 2020 several things. We knew that the risk to children from this disease was minuscule, proven all over the world from dozens of studies in dozens of countries. 
that the risk of uh, in, of infection fatality in in people under 20 was something like 0.0003 percent. Uh, and re-looking at that data, even today, the risk is so low that there are actually less deaths for children who are healthy than seasonal influenza. Even though that you know that ignites people when you say that, that's the fact. It's not arguable. Uh, we also knew that children are not a significant source of spread of the infection, and we knew from other countries, including Norway and Sweden, et cetera, that opening Finland, that opening schools was not a risk uh, to either the community or the teachers who are a low risk population by their age demographic. So all of those things we knew. We also knew in 2006, the pandemic management standard was not lockdowns. Lockdowns were known to be both ineffective and harmful. And in fact, in that article by Henderson and colleagues, there's a quote about schools and it says it is it is known that closing schools for anywhere more than say 10 to 14 days after the very beginning of an epidemic is not recommended because it doesn't work. Uh, and here we had a disease that was very low risk for children, for healthy children. And we also knew by spring of 2020, the third thing, which is that children are destroyed when you close in-person schools. Okay, the spring of 2020, school closures in the United States, just from that alone, there were about 300,000 cases of child abuse that went unreported because schools are the number one agency for that, noticing that. But we also saw an explosion right away that was reported by the CDC itself in June of 2020 that there was an explosion of anxiety and depressive disorder in, in college age and teenagers. Uh, there was suicidal thought. One out of four college-age kids thought of killing himself in the spring of 2020, not from the virus, from the isolation. You know, I think we all know as parents, but even those of us who aren't, that children and young people need their social networks. Uh, I mean, that's critical. And beyond that, all the things you learn in school, beyond the learning, is social uh, integration is how to resolve conflicts, is socialization, physical activity, poor kids, nutrition. Uh, and so what happened, what we did, we closed schools, if I may go on. Okay, we were an outlier. People in the U.S. don't realize it. In Western Europe, despite the stringent lockdowns, most Western European peer nations opened their schools, not all, but most. They knew the data. Uh, and so what happened in the U.S.? Well, in, this, in September 2020, something like 18% of American kids in K-12 through were in in-person schools. In our state of California, 15% of the 6 million kids in public school were in in-person schools. Whereas in Florida, you may realize, although Gavin Newsom will say something else soon, uh, Florida opened all the schools in person. Uh, in by end of August 2020. And, and what happened when you don't open those schools beyond all the uh, losses of learning, including the lowest scores in math in decades since the test was given, uh, and of course, always worse for the low-income families and poor kids. You know, we're supposed to be a country that cares about low-income people, poor kids. Okay, that's, that's talk when you actually act a different way. And what happened was we had an explosion over the year 2020 in teenage girls of suicide, in college age and teenage kids of drug abuse, so substance abuse, overdoses, manic depressive visits to doctors. This is not survey data. This is actually documented visits to medical doctors for anxiety disorder, depressive disorder in college age kids. Uh, we, in addition, created a public health nightmare because in 2020, more than half of college-age people in the United States put on an, unnecess an unwanted weight gain of averaging 28 pounds. Mm. Okay, that's an obesity crisis. We have really created a disaster. We have really harmed a whole generation and uh, we've taught little toddlers they're a vector for disease, that they're a danger to everyone, everyone's a danger to them. I mean, this is a sin, okay? Even, uh, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's going to take decades to even understand how bad the damage is. And, you know, this went on to the final thing I'll say 
about what happened was that we also became a culture, a country, that injected young children with an experimental drug with known side effects for a disease that they did not have a significant risk from, mainly to use them as shields for adults. And I, I, don't, I don't even know how to get my hands around that kind of behavior, but that is the most immoral, unethical display of anything that, that I have seen in my, in my life. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> in your book, you describe at length the efforts and the continuation, uh, all that you did gathering data, going to the meetings, presenting it, arguing, bringing in experts to talk to people. So presenting these facts to the policymakers, but getting nowhere, and in the meantime, taking horrible uh, personal abuse for trying to help the situation. So the question is, if it's impossible to get policymakers to listen to facts when it's, a, when it's presented so clearly and known so widely, but they pay no attention to it and make pol bad policy anyway, um, what can we in this room or any of us do to help guard against such measures being repeated in the future um, or, you know, made worse, as we see usually crises get worse mm -hmm. from the prior one? Well, I mean, this is really the question because, uh, you know, Rand Paul mentioned that there will be other pandemics, but it won't even just be pandemics in my view. There will be other things that are declared as health emergencies. You know, every, everybody knows that climate change could easily be called a health emergency by people who want to call it that. And I fully anticipate that will happen, by the way. Um, so uh, one clear thing is we need to educate everybody on the facts and people get some people get bored of hearing all this data. But the reality is there's a lot of people, shockingly high percentage of people who've never heard the data. I mean, and I speak all over the country and people who are supportive of me in general, it's not like they're blocking it themselves. They've never heard the data. Uh, so we need to keep talking about that. We need to make public people who led this fiasco publicly accountable. They will never apologize for what they do, but we must demand it because that alone is a, is a public a sort of airing of what happened. I don't trust Congress at all to do a non-politicized investigation. I mean, I just think you'd have to be pretty naive to think that. That's not going to happen. Uh, but uh, other, other commissions maybe, but in, in any event, we, we must keep talking and make people aware. We must demand at least have a voice of demand for accountability. We must get involved, okay? I mean, first of all, the era of trusting people based on their credentials alone is over. I mean, I, the, the amount of incompetence that exists is shocking, uh, but also the amount of sort of bad motives for what people do that are in power. Uh, so we need to get involved ourselves. We, we can't be afraid. We need to empower other people. The most important thing you do when you speak up uh, and I've been told this many times, is we, we allow other people, we embolden other people to speak up. I mean, we have a deficit of courage in our leadership in this country. We have a massive deficit, and we have a massive deficit, deficit apparently, of, of, of moral conduct in our leaders. So, uh, you know, we need to step up ourselves. Uh, we, we, can, uh, we can't expect other people to just do things. I know most of us are not people who publicly protest or get involved in things. But I think, uh, particularly in this issue, uh, I think you, it's a step too far. It's a line crossed when you start hurting people's children. And I think we saw that in educational curricula uh, in Virginia. That's why the governor was, was elected. Uh, and I think that we need to get involved in the school boards. We need to be regular people showing that actually democracy can function and, you know, the people that are elected, in the end, they are affected by who their voters are going to be and what the public opinion is. So we can't stay silent and let a vocal minority dictate what happens. Uh, you know, we see what happens 
when you're, it, it, I understand people are afraid. I understand people were afraid and acted irrationally, really, because of fear. That's what fear does. Totally understandable. But at some point, enough is enough. We have to speak up. We have to help our neighbors. And uh, by the way, uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, I feel we have a country where basic civility is lost to people who disagree with you. And we can't have a country like that. So we need to have more and more conversations, even with people who disagree. We need we need to be able to listen uh, to other people. And I know these are just sort of general things, but it's on my mind that uh, I was just saying I, I travel quite a bit and give talks in other countries, and they don't have this viciousness. They disagree. But when I go give a talk at University of Milan Law School, where they were hit by COVID, uh, we then go out to dinner. You know, we have a Campari. I mean, you know, they're not, uh, you know, trying to put me in jail for what I said. So uh, I think we need to restore civility because we need to have an integrated country where we can discuss these issues and derive the truths that we so desperately need. Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, James, your work among the global poor has earned you the sobriquet of a 21st century Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. but you've also suffered great personal costs in doing your work, including uh, imprisonment in India, which is a harrowing tale for another day. Um, but we're very grateful that you've pushed through and now are turning your talents for American school children. Um, frankly, as Scott's talked about, American culture seems to have it in for children these days. Um, Scott's talked about the sin of children being made shields for the health of adults during COVID. But beyond that, um, public schools have become what C.S. Lewis called experiment houses that have turned away from education to an agenda that seems designed, designed to produce unlearned, dependent narcissists. Um, how is how is England different during the COVID era, and um, how could you compare the experience there to what's going, what you've heard about or know about what's going on in the U.S.? So, so, so thank you, Mary, and thank you, Scott, for your description of something that was really horrible, and I don't differ in it from from what you were saying. I don't, I don't demur from anything you've been saying. And you ask about England. I, actually, I know le less about England than I do about many other countries around the world. And what you should know about India and Uganda, for instance, is they had they closed the schools. Government closed all schools for 83 weeks in in Uganda, 82 weeks in India. So, and 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 again, the evidence was very clear. Children were not at risk. They were not there to communicate the disease either. Why did government close down those schools? Because, of course, the teacher unions are very strong and the, the, the emphasis is, on, is on, um, on, on something else. You know? So, so I, I don't disagree with anything you said there, but, and, and, and it will sound slightly odd to some people if I come in now and say, yes, but, yes, but there Something happened during that enforced lockdown around the world, but let's focus on America and a little bit um, about what was happening here in England too. And although it was enforced, although it was terrible, something happened which perhaps has speeded up a process which would have taken a few years longer to happen. And I'm not saying I'm grateful for it, but I am grateful that this process is speeding up. And it was when something like this, it was um, during lockdown, parents saw what was happening in the closed public schools, but public schools and other schools were sending material home. They saw a few things. One, they saw the curriculum and many parents were horrified or at least mildly disturbed or disturbed by some of the things that were in the curriculum. Um, whether it was to do with gender identity theory or C CRT or other aspects, they were disturbed. Another thing happened that parents saw how maybe little attention was being, uh, how little time the curriculum in in um, in that the schools were doing took their children, and they also realised that 
some of them, some of them, this was a minority, but it, it is a genuine statistic that some children and some families felt that their family life had improved during lockdown. And it was part of that experience recognizing, okay, this is, this is not good, but we recognize that what's going on in the public schools is not good. And therefore, there, were, there was this huge rise, huge rise, 30% rise, um, larger than that but uh, uh, initially, but resting on 30% increase in children doing homeschooling. Homeschooling is now well over 3 million children in America. And there was a, uh, also a big increase in children going to private schools, leaving the public schools. So there was this recognition that public schooling is not good enough. You mentioned a couple of things, Scott. You said, you know, looking at the curriculum in the schools, that was why a, a governor was elected in Virginia, I think. And you also talked about us getting more and more involved with school boards. My life's work has been about something else, as uh, talked about in this book and, and others, um, that actually we need to get away from government being, someone put it here, co-parenting our children. No, government has no role in that. And that what we should be doing, and the lesson we learned from lockdown is actually government has, government doesn't do this well in schools, in public schooling. We want to get away from that. And so I actually see a great opportunity emerging and the opportunity, I can spell it out, but Mary, shall I get straight into yeah, that? Or, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the opportunity is a, a three or fourfold, but it's focusing on alternatives to public schooling. And one of those alternatives represented by several people here I've met earlier is homeschooling. But homeschooling is not straightforward. Um, homeschooling can mean, yes, you you're just at home with your kids and you teach the kids throughout, but it's more likely to mean that you send your children maybe two, three, four, even five days a week to a homeschooling academy, a homeschooling co-op. And these are emerging as alternatives. And why are parents going for those alternatives? I mean, to summarize, it's because they don't like what's happening in the government schools, whether it's the public schools, whether it's because they don't like the curriculum, they don't like the teaching methods, they don't like the lack of freedom, they don't like government breathing down the necks and dictating the curriculum. Whatever it is, that's the common theme. So home schools emerge, hybrid schools where children are in home and, and, uh, and, and in other schools uh, uh, the rest of the time. And then micro schools emerge. And these are all strong alternatives, which at the moment are serving what? Is it, is it uh, homeschool, private schools are 10, 15% of, of school children in America are being catered for outside of this. I think it can get much bigger than that, but. Uh, well, and that's certainly what you found globally is, is vast majorities of children being in yeah. low cost private yeah. schools and in, in the slums and a, a minority in rural areas, but still a very significant number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, we have the idea that uh, alternatives to public schooling are very expensive, either in time, if you're homeschooling, you have to be homeschooling your children, or in money, if you're sending them to a private school. Uh, is that accurate? So, so there are expensive ways of doing homeschooling. There are expensive ways of doing um, uh, other schooling. But you, you mentioned the work overseas, and I, although... You know, sometimes the relevance you know might be hard to get. But actually, do you remember back? Some of you will remember back in 1980 there was this program, "If Japan Can, Why Can't We?" which was looking at the motor industry and saying we've got to learn from this country that's developing strongly. Japan in the automotive industry, we can learn from that. And I think there should be a similar phrase going around: "If India can, if Nigeria can, why can't we?" Because what's happening in these countries, and I document it here and in, in another book, um, what's happening in these countries is parents, including the poorest parents on this planet, which is a lesson for us for what we're, we're doing, what we want to do here, the poorest parents on this planet do not acquiesce in the mediocrity of state, of public schooling. They do not acquiesce in the lack of accountability. They do not acquiesce in being supplicants to the public system, they create alternatives, 
entrepreneurs within these poor communities create alternatives, private, I call them low-cost private schools, but you call them, it turns out, you call them micro-schools. You call them hybrid schools. These alternatives emerge in these countries and after time, affordable to the poor, affordable to the poor, such that uh, the equivalent would probably be equivalent to about three or four thousand dollars for a, a, a year here, I, I would guess. But in, in those countries, charging a hundred, two hundred dollars a year, um, affordable to the poor, better than the public schooling. Lots of studies show that, and these schools are scalable. They are already at scale. They're serving the majority of kids in poor parts of. Uh, of Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, and so on, uh, India. And they are an alternative which doesn't just stop with 10, 15% of children, doesn't stop there. It actually provides an alternative which everyone can embrace. And my, I, f I feel, I've, been spent, I've just spent three days looking at some of the homeschooling academies and micro schools, and I intend to spend much more time here, as Mary intimated, I see something. I, I think there is a there's something there's a verge of a movement being created here, and to tie it back to what Scott was saying, lockdown was horrific. There were terrible problems, but if it has speeded up this revolution, this movement where you're moving away from public schooling, you're moving away from assuming government can solve your education problems, and seeing that actually we can do it ourselves, we can do it as people, as parents. That, I think, is a little bit of a positivity we can take away from this whole experience. Thank you. We're, we're going to move to questions in just a minute. I just want to say that one of my favorite stories that you tell is you were sitting and talking to the head of a, a, one of these small schools in India, and a mother who was in arrears on tuition came in to work out a payment plan to catch up on, on her back payments. And you're sitting there and said, oh, it's just a few rupees, and you offer to pay it for her. And she looked at you like, what? How dare you? And you realize that that's, that's how she keeps the school accountable. The school is accountable to her. She's paying the fees. And so if they're not teaching her children, she's going to hold them responsible for not doing a good job. And I think that's so important, and we've gotten in this country with the government schools a complete divide between parents and their children that the teachers will say, and this even happened to my mother in the 1950s, go home, we're the experts, leave it to us. It's none of your business. So I'm very grateful for the uh, title of the event is From Crisis to Opportunity. We're very sorry for the crisis and the terrible price that children have paid. And hopefully it does present a pro opportunity for children to have much brighter futures uh, with that, we'll open it for questions, if there are any. Is there a mic? Uh, there's a mic that somebody is going to pass. There you go, Christopher. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, my name is Chuck Woolery, former chair of the United Nations Association Council of Organizations. Uh, in 96 and 97, I was issues director at the, Bio, uh, at the Global Health Council, worked on uh, uh, biosecurity issues, pandemics, and uh, I just have one, I agree with a lot that's being said. Uh, even though I teach at a private school, they closed out for two two seasons. That pissed me off. Anyway, um, uh, the gain of function uh, purpose, if you understand it, uh, I, I got to interview uh, Ken Olabekov, who was the Soviet weapons, uh, the biological, uh, second in command of the biological weapons program the Soviet Union had before it collapsed. He defected to the United States. And he told me about smallpox, which... You probably know killed more people in the last century than all the wars and revolutions and pandemic uh, uh, genocides combined. He said they weaponized it to kill. He normally kills about three percent of a population. They weaponized it to kill ninety-five percent of the population. And us having access to that, what they developed biologically, would given us a chance to develop a, a vaccine to prevent protect us. I could go into a lot more detail on this, but I'm not going to. But the, the, the bottom line is, uh, the advances in biotechnology since then are off the chart. 200 million proteins have now been, uh, the structures have been analyzed by AI and can be used or misused by anyone with a, with a, uh, with a, with a bad intent. 
And you mentioned earlier about preventing the abuse of this this research, gain of function research. You can't stop the abuse of technology. It's going to happen. You need to talk to the really deal with the hearts and the the hearts and the minds of people to prevent the abuse of it. And so right now there are people designing biological weapons that ethnically targeting people, white, black, Jews. It's it's happening. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. So, but except I, I teach at a Jewish school, I'm trying to convince them. I, I believe that the Jewish, that the Israel is working on gain of function to find out what are the worst biological weapons that could be used to target Jews and then developing the countermeasures for it. So you have to do that because of the, 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 the anger in the world at the United States and what we have done with our foreign policy. The Cato Institute, who values liberty, Ivan Eland published a report 20-some years ago about 50 terrorist attacks against the United States, and all but two of them were caused by us, our foreign policy. And the only two that weren't were the Unabomber and who else? Ted Krasinski. Okay. Anyway, I could go on all day about this because I, I just wanted you to know that I'm going to quote the latest federal agency director, CISA, CISA. Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, she said, everything's connected, everything's interdependent, and everything is vulnerable. We need a global approach. So whatever this Congress decides to do, it's not going to help unless the world is aligned with it. I'll stop there. So Scott, do you agree there's nothing that can be done to protect about against such things? Well, I, I, I'll... I think there is one important point there uh, that I would like to highlight, and that is that um, there is an argument why gain-of-function type research should be done. And the argument generally is to develop protections against uh, very dangerous products of weaponized you know, biological material. So uh, and that, I think the gentleman was uh, pointing uh, one of those things out uh, because the second corollary is if you think that the gain of function research is going to be done, then sort of you have to wonder, is it smart to not do it in the very sophisticated country with very good safety measures like here? The problem uh, of what uh, Senator Paul was pointing out, well, what he pointed out was, or I, I don't know if he said it, but um, gain of function research was done funded by the NIH, Anthony Fauci, and Francis Collins. That's a fact. It was funded when that research was forbidden in the United States. It was funded in China and specifically in the Wuhan lab. And this is government uh, Office of Accountability document. This is a fact. It's not uh, an opinion during the years where it was forbidden in this country. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's a system that's out of control. I'm not sure. I don't think anyone has the answer to whether there should be gain of function research done. There are a lot. Of, there are very strong opinions, but uh, it certainly shouldn't be farmed out to countries that have very sloppy labs with, uh, you know, with the U.S. financing it when it's forbidden in the United States. I mean, some of these things are really, uh, you know, off the charts, uh, completely wrong, and I think there will be some accountability for that. And that's back to your point too. Of that's the reason why it's so important to hold people accountable. Um, to hopefully make others think twice about acting recklessly if they know that they will pay a price personally, which they currently aren't. So. Right. Mary. Oh, hi. Um, Joseph Aginde. So I have a question um, about what you were saying about within COVID, with COVID, people are pulling the kids out of school. There's more homeschooling. What do you think are the um, going to be the repercussions for public schools in terms of funding. If if people are, are we will that create more diverting resources towards homeschooling, and um, how will that affect kids in private school? And yeah, yeah. So so it, it's a good question, which gets asked around the world. You know, when I when I've done my work in Nigeria or or India or other other countries, people say, why are you focusing on the the private schools when you know the public schools um, can get you know 
deprived of money and deprived of funds and 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 so on. And I I, I always say I'm only ever interested in education in terms of what parents are seeking for their children and what parents are typically seeking for their children in countries around the world is the better option and typically that better option is a non a non public schooling option and and so i'm very happy if if the parents are looking to private options to homeschooling to homeschooling academies and so on and I want to see those options grow in strength, grow in influence, grow in impact. And the public system in other countries I've studied, other countries I've seen, starts to wither away and becomes less important. That's, that's, just, that's the way I want to see this happening. So I'm, I'm happy to see the non-public schooling alternatives grow in strength, grow in, um, in, de in demand, and that is really, yeah, the extent of what I, I, mean, I want to see. Can I add, add a comment to this, uh, which is a, a couple of comments. Number one, uh, I don't look at it as a divergence of money. The school doesn't own that money. That's U.S. taxpayer money. The government doesn't own the money. So the divergence of money is from the taxpayer to the public school system. That's divergence of money. That's an allocation of money that they are not entitled to. That's just done. Uh, that's sort of a riff on Margaret Thatcher's comment, the government has no money, it's the people's money. Um, but the second part is really children, uh, people, parents, and I'm a father, I want the best schools for my kids. And so when people choose another school, it's because it's better. I think you have to make that assumption. And so uh, I think we're all uh, for the best education for our kids, and if there's competition to get there, that's fantastic. The public schools better up their game or people are opting to go elsewhere. And yeah. people. This is for Scott Atlas. Um, what, room, what truth is there to the rumors that in Russia and Ukraine, they were uh, doing gain of function really strongly in various labs? Uh, I don't know the answer to the question. I mean, there's a lot of that kind of research being done uh, in several countries, including in the United States, including when it was forbidden, actually in labs at universities. So, but I don't have a specific comment on that. Dr. Atlas, I know your MO is to assimilate a great deal of data that you read and acquire to, as you uh, advise President Trump, uh, to provide good public policy. I think we've all noticed there are a lot more people wearing masks right now. Um, if you travel on planes, you go anywhere in the public, there are a lot of people wearing masks again. So what is coming? Um, you know, those of us who know the data about masks uh, are, are kind of wondering what's going on here. But at the same time, what do we not yet know? So from your uh, assimilation of the latest data, tell us what's coming. Well, I mean, I'm not sure what's coming is related to the data. Uh, that's, but, um, you know, the data is, is on the mass. Uh, I, I think uh, Senator Paul uh, sort of summed that up a little bit with this Cochran review. Uh, the data is known, it was known in May 2020, the CDC had compiled the data on airborne respiratory viruses, influenza, which is relevant because it's the same size roughly as this virus for COVID, uh, that masks don't work. Surgical masks don't work. That was published in May of 2020. They do not protect the wearer, nor do they protect others when you are wearing a mask. Uh, then there was several studies being done, including a, a very good study in, in uh, November 2020 in the Annals of Internal Medicine, the Dutch study it's called, uh, where they proved that for COVID, there is no significant protection of the wearer of masks, surgical masks, not bandanas, not scarves. And they also tested 11 other viruses and that didn't work for any of the viruses. And then we have several other studies and eventually the Cochrane Review. And let me explain what the Cochrane, I'm getting to the answer to your question. The Cochrane Review was published this year, which was a, an analysis of all of the sound data, all of the sound data. It is not a separate study. 
And the conclusions were twofold. Number one, surgical masks do not limit the spread of this infection. And number two, N95 masks are no different from surgical masks. So uh, the, interview, the interview of the senior author of the Cochrane Review was quoted as saying, masks do not work, period, full stop, quote unquote. That's, just, that's the data on masks. And if people are saying masks work, uh, they are saying the earth is flat. They are the flat earthers of this century. Now, that's frightening because these people are in power. Uh, it took the Catholic Church 359 years to publicly admit that Galileo was right that the earth moved. And I'm afraid we got a few hundred years left to get to that point. What's going to happen uh, it's difficult. I think it'll change based on where you live. I mean, we live in California. We see a lot of people. I see a lot of people flying in and out of SFO with masks on. Uh, you know, the problem is people are still afraid. They've been subjected to propaganda and fear and fear, you know, uh, does that kind of thing. So I'm afraid we're going to see masks and I think we will see some mask mandates. There's mask mandates in medical facilities in California right now for instance. The question is how many people are going to listen to the mask mandates if you're just talking about masks. I think there's a lot of people who think, wait a second, this doesn't work, uh, period. And it's actually harmful, harmful to young children with language development. There's a recent article on the chemicals in these N95 masks that are toxic. I mean, people don't even think about this stuff. So uh, I am afraid that the people in power are both incompetent and uh, they want to do something. And that something is just literally anything. And I think masks and other mandates uh, are, are on the table. I mean, they just approved under emergency use authorization, the new COVID vaccine, that booster they call it, emergency use authorization, and recommended it two weeks ago for all people over six months of age. Okay, number one, why would there be an emergency use authorization? There is no public health emergency today, none. So this is completely insane to say there's an emergency use authorization when there's no emergency. And the reason that's important is because emergency use authorizations circumvent the standards of safety and efficacy evaluations. So. Everything's on the table as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sad to say that. There's also a phenomenon that's been seen about news stories. So a news story comes out, and then later there's a correction that's issued. People do not remember the correction. They re remember the original story. Right. And so that's the challenge that we face is figuring out ways to get around that whatever it is, protection against truth, um, and using every means uh, at our disposal. Uh, um, Dr. Alice does this podcast, which is wonderfully effective medium, but you know, we just have to use every means we can, including story, humor, um, movies, whatever, and just try to get these points across to people. If here, here, and there is somebody over here. Hello, okay. Um, thank you so much, panel, for all of your information. And thank you, Dr. Tule, for your extensive research across the globe. I find that a lot of themes in your book parallel what's happening um, with homeschoolers in the United States, and I do see it as an opportunity. My question to you is, like Dr. Atlas said, we care about the low-income kids, or we're supposed to, because we see that, you know, we see this population at a disadvantage, and we've had this massive achievement gap for decades in the United States in public schools. Um, my question to you is how do you answer the UN when in their GEM report last year or their 21-22 Global Education and Monitoring Report, they, they acknowledge research like yours that says 350 million kids around the world are being educated by non-state actors, and yet they make a call for all governments to see educating children as part of a single system and their reason is disparities. So are they just making that up because your research kind of flies in the face of that? Or what is our answer to the disparity question 
you know, when we moved to, I mean, you proved that poor people can do it and they're organizing themselves to solve the problem and they actually don't want the state help. But how do we answer that argument that you're ignoring the low income populations? So it's, it's simply not true, is it? And you said the UN is motivated by a desire to, uh, you know, eliminate disparity and so on. The, the UN could well be motivated by many other things and not necessarily what they, they say they're motivated by. But my research, and thank you for mentioning it, categorically shows that the poor, by all accounts, the poorest in, uh, on the people on this planet, can access and afford and uh, uh, go get, get entrepreneurs within their communities to create private alternatives that do um, serve them, they serve them better than the the public schooling old, um, that that is available, and the, the the disparity problem starts to disappear with with those. So it is simply not the case. And I can give you study after study after study, some of the which I've done, some of which other people have done, that shows that the poor are being served and they're being served better by these schools. So the I mean, you started talking about the the problems here, and obviously, I I don't know enough about the American situation yet. I hope to know more, but the the key is the public sector here. Public schooling has let groups down, and you know, and I, and I know there there are there are lots of communities of you know African American communities and other communities here who feel let down by the public schooling and are looking for alternatives. And now, I mean, this, the, the data shows, the recent study showed that um, Af African-American families are more likely to consider homeschooling or the homeschooling academies than, than white parents or Latin, uh, Latino, uh, Latin American, uh, so La Latino parents, yeah. And they're more likely now to want to consider homeschooling or to consider old alternatives. And why are they doing that? Because they recognize they've been let down by the public public schooling sector. So, you know, my, my life's work in a way and summarized in books like this has been to show that that, that the, the people who advocate for public schooling are not necessarily advocating for what serves the poor better. They're not looking, you know, the question I was asked earlier, you know, um, was what do you do about the public schools then? You know, what do you do about, what you do is you, focus on what parents are choosing and what parents want for their children and you and you focus on making that better and that is the way forward for for the poor so um it, it's not true what you're being what others are telling us you know there's there's a common theme you know, that, that often that there are untruths out there and uh, we have to negotiate our way through them my life's work was, I, I spent a lot of time going through studies that did seem to show the opposite. And there's one very famous study, which was a randomized controlled trial of a voucher program in, in, in India, in, in Andhra Pradesh. And the, the result came out, the private schools are no better than the government schools. Private schools are no better. And I looked through the, looked through the evidence and found actually that uh, this the so-called gold standard randomized controlled trial had used different tests in the public schools than the private schools in most of them. And that com completely invalidated the results, but it was, you know, it was published in a highly reputable uh, economics journal. That sort of counter information we've got to always, always go after. And, uh, you know, we, we, we can't rest, you know, we, we, we've got to keep on chall challenging it. Yeah. One of our senior fellows uh, constantly reminds us to ask the question, cui bono, who yeah, the benefits? benefits? Yeah, yeah. And in the case of mandates and shutdowns and so on, you know, clearly you're getting pe giving people a lot more power. I mean, the power over what you can do with your life uh, in your home, on the beach, whatever. And, and uh, boy, that kind of power would sure go to one's head, as, especially as we know very well the power crops. Um, qui bono in terms of denying that private schools uh, level disparity, produce better results for the poorest of the poor. Yeah. Well, think about who would not want that to be known. So, yeah, who benefits? Yeah. Hi. 
Uh, first, I want to thank you for dedicating so much work in your life to this topic. It's really quite personal to me. I mean, personal pain point in my life was the experience of uh, learned helplessness and um, lack of agency in school and how this affected the course of my life. So uh, my personal aim is in long term to work in education. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, my questions for Dr. Tooley uh, related to innovation. I don't currently work in education. I currently work um, at startups, uh, currently for a pro-life coffee company called Seven Weeks. Check it out. Um, but I'm currently looking at starting a new publication about alternative forms of education. So I'd love to chat with you more and um, anyone here who's working on that. Uh, but I would just love to hear a little bit about what are some of your favorite innovations, um, creative approaches that you've seen in these schools that you've worked on in different places, just anything that was interesting. Yeah. And and, and actually, actually I've, I've just been visiting just for a few days some innovative um, ideas in America, and I've been very impressed by the way different homeschooling academies and so on are organizing themselves. Very, very, very simple things, but having having opportunities like um, uh, self-employed teachers, so you don't have to get involved in too much regulation with teachers. You know, uh, little, little little things like that are important. But I, I suppose when people talk about innovation, they they normally talk are well, thinking about technology um, and how that can help learning. And I I, I have seen some some wonderful situations where even in the relatively low cost schools um, children have been using adaptive learning programs in mathematics for, for instance now mathematics is a hierarchical subject and if you miss out on any step on the way then you're lost forever in mathematics and so this adaptive learning program that i've seen children using in in some of the schools this was in honduras actually um the the um the adaptive learning program finds out your individual level where you are and then takes you from there to to the goal that, that you, you're, you're seeking and uh, th those sort of programs I found very exciting I, I've seen very innovative ways now they, they sound they sound small but that some of the low-cost private schools recognizing that the parents are that are, are daily laborers or they, they work in market stores. Their, their their income is daily, create daily fees for the schools. So they completely correspond to where the the parents are are earning. But actually, in in this book, there is a chapter, and this is sort of almost coming, you know, almost risking disappointing you. But one of my great sadnesses about schools in many parts of the poorest, you know, poorest parts of the world was that the, um, the, the schools were not able to innovate enough in terms of curriculum because governments were still imposing a particular form of curriculum, a particular form of testing, national testing. And if your poor parents felt that, you know, that their schools should still be doing that, even though they weren't, you know, they weren't necessarily convinced about it, but they felt that that really should still be the way forward. And so there are, there are exciting things happening, but there's still much room for improvement. And I, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about what I'm seeing in America, very, you know, I've just seen over a few days and I want to see more of is, if America can crack this problem, if America can show how innovation can come into schools that are alternatives for public schooling, and if America can show how you can do this relatively cheaply and at scale, the rest of the world will be, will, will be willing to catch up with you. You know, you 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 will be able to you will be able to take this model elsewhere. Where America lead, America can lead on this, and I'm really excited about yes, innovations elsewhere, but innovations that you're seeing here, that you're doing here. I'm excited to know more about them. Maybe one more question, Christopher. Yes, thank you both for being here. Um, so my question. Primarily is going to probably apply to you, Dr. Tooley, but uh, Dr. Atlas, if you have anything with there. Uh, so we're talking about uh, state regulation, state oversight with with education. And now school choice is obviously a big topic. Uh, so my question for you is um, in your data that you've seen across the globe and maybe some of the stuff that you have seen, have you seen any detrimental 
um, effects, um, detrimental outcomes towards private homeschool communities accepting government funds, especially if we're talking about with your illustration, you talked about how uh, accountability followed the funds of that one lady. And so that would be the same case. We would want our government to keep accountable what money they spend. And if accountability and regulation will follow the money, what's the, have you seen any detrimental effects to uh, educational liberties Yeah, with school choice and that money? It, the, the simple answer is so, so and I, I know where you're, you're going. What you, you're, you're, you're sort of going down the, the route. A lot of people in the school choice to movement in, in America, you're, you're, you're torn, aren't you? Should you accept educational savings accounts, ESAs funding, or should you not? Should you try and resist them? And those who think you should resist them are saying, well, you know, um, he, he who pays the piper calls the tune, and therefore it's likely that government regulations will impede on what you're doing and you're frightened of that. And then there are others who say, well, but it's money, you know, it's, it's money that is our money, is our ta taxpayers' money, and, you know, we, 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 you know, we might as well get a bit of it back and, and now. And, and I've, um, I have seen not ESAs and, and not applied to homeschooling, but I've seen educational vouchers and I've seen studies of those, which were a, another way of, of, of doing this, of bringing government money in. And what the, what the studies have shown is that the children who are given the vouchers and going to the private schools do perform much better than the children who go who are stay in, in, in the government schools. What we don't know, there's been no studies about this, is do they do as well as the, the children in the schools where their own parents are paying? That's the question we don't know the answer to. Logically, you presented the logical argument, logically it would seem that there would be some undermining of that special relationship between the parent who pays and, and the school. Logically, it would seem there would be some detriment. We, there's no study that's looked at that. It would be good to have a study looking at that, particularly in the context perhaps of homeschooling in America and elsewhere. Yeah. Wonderful. So we have, we have the room for a little bit longer and welcome you to talk with both our speakers and with one another. Really appreciate your coming and hope this has been helpful and we can apply these lessons going forward and avoid what we've experienced for the past three years, especially for our children. Thank you.